Welcome to the latest version of the Civitas Virtual Poll Luncheon. I'm Mitch Kokai from the John Locke Foundation, joined by my colleague Donna King. And for those of you who are fans of the show Front Row on PBS, don't adjust either your watch or your calendar. Uh, it is not 8.30 on Friday night or noon on Sunday. You're not watching PBS. You are watching the Civitas Virtual Poll Luncheon. We're going to give you some details about the poll in just a matter of moments. But first of all, for those of you who are wondering, hey, when can we get back in to see these poll lunch presentations in person? We will be returning to in-person presentations coming up in the not too distant future. Stay tuned to your announcements because we would love to see you in person for upcoming Civitas poll presentations. Let's go ahead and uh, go to the slides right now to give you a little bit of background information about this latest poll. This is the Civitas poll, a statewide survey conducted for the John Locke Foundation. It was conducted from June 17th through the 20th, the sample size, 600 voters. Give you a little bit on the methodology. Conducted with the 600 likely 2022 general election voters, has a margin of error of plus or minus 4%. Known registered voters interviewed via live phones, SMS, and email invitation. And the survey was weighted to a likely 2022 general election voter universe. Some other housekeeping to get to before uh, we get to the actual meat of this survey. For those of you who are following along on Twitter, the John Locke Foundation's handle is at John Locke NC. For Carolina Journal, at Carolina Journal. Donna's handle is Donna King CJ. Mine is my name, Mitch Kokai. And uh, if you don't know how to spell it, neither does anyone else. But you can see it right there on the screen if you want to walk it uh, uh, mark it down. Signal is the company that uh, conducts the poll for the Civitas poll. And you can find them in at Signal, C-Y-G-N-A-L. And if you'd like to talk about some of the results that you're uh, hearing, weigh in on them, please feel free to hashtag Civitas poll. Let's now go ahead and uh, get into the poll itself. And the first thing that we look at is the electoral environment. And Donna, we're going to talk, first of all, about the, the standard right direction, wrong track right. uh, uh, category. Generally speaking, would you say that things in the United States are headed in the right direction or off on the wrong track? According to North Carolina voters, things in the U.S. still on the wrong track. A substantial partisan gap exists on that as well. If you look at the general number, 56% wrong track, 37% right direction. But uh, what about those numbers that we see on the screen there of Republicans, unaffiliated, and Democrats? Wide variety. It really is. I think that one of the interesting things about this is that um, we see such a broad gap between Republicans uh, and Democrats. Of course, Republicans coming in at uh, seven percent uh, wrong track, but ninety right track, right track, ninety-two percent right wrong track. Um, now, it's not a huge surprise given that right now in North Carolina we have uh, Democratic Governor Roy Cooper among Republicans not as happy with performance, particularly during the pandemic shutdowns, school shutdowns, a lot of the things that we're seeing Democrats, though not as uh, adamantly right track as I would have thought given that situation. Um, right now we're seeing, you know, only about 21 percent um, saying we're wrong track. So I think it's an interesting uh, Republicans much stronger. Uh, on that wrong track opinion. And bad news for Democrats and those who are in charge who are Democratic politicians that the unaffiliated have a 20 point gap, 56% sure. thinking that we're on the wrong track. Right, and that unaffiliated group is really growing in North Carolina, particularly in the urban areas and the suburban areas. Those, uh, those regions are something that Republicans really um, probably are gonna be focused on in the next few years between the before 22, because those regions have a lot of unaffiliated voters and a lot of swing voters. We're going to go now to another election-related issue. Uh, obviously, if people think you're going in the right direction or on the wrong track, that will affect how you're looking at the uh, electoral picture. And so we have the generic ballot tests looking ahead to the 22 elections, the generic ballots for state legislature and Congress. Still pretty tight with Republicans opening up just a narrow lead on both ballots. You see there the, the ballot for the state legislature. And of course, we know no one votes for a generic Republican versus generic <laughs> Democrat. There are actual names on there, and that affects everything. But if people are given this opportunity, 
The Republican in the le generic ballot state legislature has uh, a little less than 47 percent versus the Democrat 45 percent. And when you look at the generic ballot for Congress, Republicans are a little less than 48 percent versus uh, Democrats at 45 percent. Uh, what do you think about that? Well, I think there's a couple of things that are interesting in this. One, uh, that this is actually down from our May poll. Um, so in May, it was around 47 percent for the Republican candidate and 44 percent for the Democrat candidate. So, uh, you know, things are, are going the opposite direction, and that's something that I think that we'll be having to walk, watch very closely. Um, you know, one of the things that we're going to be looking at in just a moment is the, uh, that Republicans, of registered Republicans, they still say that they're going to go 94 percent for Republican ballot. Democrats uh, say they're going to go 89 percent. So people are really sticking with their registered party at this point. Uh, but as we get closer to 22, I think that uh, we're going to see that change as more and more people, are they going to stick with their party? Are we going to become, you know, just as, as, as strict in that? Or are people going to be voting more for the candidates? And definitely the generic ballot test is important, but as pointed out a little while ago, you have real candidates on there. So right. the candidate can make a difference. And of course, this election will be very important because of redistricting. So we don't even exactly. know who all the congressional candidates are or what the congressional districts will look like because we're going to gain that 14th seat. We'll still have 120 state House seats and 50 state Senate seats, but we don't know exactly uh, where they're going to go. You already uh, mentioned a little bit that from the next slide, which is the legislative generic ballot heat map. Right. And uh, you pointed out I, 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 it, that is very interesting that Republicans are say 94 percent of them say they're going to go for the Republican candidate, whereas uh, when you look at the Democrats, uh, it's 89 percent. When you look at conservative versus liberal, it's kind of interesting. Sure. They, they tend to go together, but the conservatives, in this case, say 86 percent of them say they'll go for the Republican candidate, whereas 95 percent of the liberals say they're going to go for the Democratic candidate. So liberals, even more likely than are registered D Democrats to go for the Democrats. Sure, sure. Well, what that also tells you is that they're really following party leadership and messaging is working, uh, coming from, from the leadership of that party. One thing that I think is really interesting in this heat map is when you look at the regions, you see the breakdown, um, you know, Raleigh has Democrats, you know, 53 percent are going to stick with their party. The rest of the region, um, Republicans are actually leading. So, you know, Raleigh has changed. The capital city has changed a lot. A lot of the folks that we have seen coming into North Carolina, um, you know, we, we're getting a 14th congressional district. We've got a, a large influx of people coming into the state. A lot of them are coming to the capital area and settling in the suburbs. So we're seeing that shift a little bit toward Democrats, and that's going to be something that a lot of uh, people are going to be working on their messaging, trying to do a lot of outreach to those voters, and since so many of them are unaffiliated. Yeah, very important. And of course, we know that there is no generic vote. But uh, right. it is interesting to see where things stand on that. Let's move now to the, the next slide, and that is job approval for both the president and the governor. Interesting contrast here. President Joe Biden continues to hover around a, a one to one job approval rating, sure. meaning he's either slightly above water or slightly below water. We see that uh, in June, 46 percent approved of his job performance, 48 percent disapproved. But if you look back at the previous Civitas polls, the last one in May was 48-49, also 48-49 in March. So a, a little bit more of a gap, not a lot. Meanwhile, on the side of the governor, 49 percent in the latest poll liked his job performance, 42 percent disapproved. That's a little bit more of a change. Back in May, he had a 12-point margin of 53 percent approval versus 41 percent who uh, disapproved, uh, still doing pretty well. What do you make of these numbers? Well, I think it's interesting in May, you got to remember that schools open back up. So a lot of the people who may have been frustrated um, with with some of what they saw back in March are, are suddenly glad that their kids are back in school. That things look like they were going on the right track. I think that accounts for some of the bump in Governor Cooper's numbers. Um, now we're back down to 49 percent. It's still, you know, still kind of a 50-50. Um, but I do think it's interesting that we saw that bump. That means that people are reacting to a lot of the shutdowns and, and school issues that we've seen. Um, one of the numbers that I thought was a little bit interesting going from March to June is that there's a growing unsure uh, group of people who perhaps, you know, for, for many months were very happy with what was going on or maybe very, you know, confirmed uh, not happy with what's going on. They're moving more to the middle trying to figure out what they're going to do next. 
I'm glad you brought that up because in looking at the numbers, that was one of the things that I thought of as well, and that is at this time of year, we're kind of far away from the next election. A lot of people, other than those of us who are participating sure. in this or watching this event right now, a lot of people aren't paying attention to politics. So someone calls and asks them, what do you think about what Roy Cooper's doing? <laughs> they might say, I don't care what he's doing right now. Right. I'm not going to care again until the next election. Sure. So uh, some more, pe more people are probably inclined to say, I'm not paying attention to it right now. I'm not going to give an opinion one way. Well, and people other. are getting out and they're doing things. It's summer and kids are on break and uh, we're, at, uh, we're at school up until, um, you know, up until recently. So people are kind of getting their life back and they're trying to recover from the pandemic and all these shutdowns. They may not be thinking about it. So those are the... the main ideas that we cover in the latest Civitas poll on elections, where things stand as we get ready for 2022 and perhaps 2024. Now we're going to shift gears a little bit and move into the realm of education. Education important to everyone in North Carolina, the biggest part of our state budget, of course. And there's been a lot of concern about what's happening in the schools, and the Civitas poll took a look at that issue. Uh, education direction and politicization, one of my yes. favorite words to try to have to say. <laughs> a majority of voters believe that education in this state is off on the wrong track and that classroom instruction in local K-12 schools has become increasingly political in the past five years. If you look at that, uh, the slide on the direction of education, just 26% of people think we're in the right direction. 55% think we're on the wrong track. When you look at the politics in the schools, uh, we're looking at nearly more than 65 percent who think mm -hmm. the schools are more political now versus only 4 percent who think they're less political. Right. Only Democrats, moderates, and liberals slightly more optimistic about the direction of education in the state. Even their opinion, according to our pollsters, is a little bit weak on that front. The sentiment that education is increasingly politicized holds at majority level across key demographics, including Democrats and liberals, peaking with Republicans, probably no surprise, 87 percent, conservatives 84 percent. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to ask your opinion about this. Okay. As a parent, sure. parents, 66 percent say we're on the wrong direction in schools, 73 percent say they think things are more political. As a parent, does Absolutely. that jibe with what you're hearing? Absolutely, no question about it. Uh, I, it's what I'm hearing, and a lot of that is because uh, we've had a front row seat to our kids' classroom for the last year. A lot of us have been you know, checking in and out. We've been much more engaged uh, with what they're learning, what the process is, um, what, the, what the struggle is between uh, getting the material from the classroom, from the teacher, through you know their website, through their Canvas and, and PowerSchool and all these other programs that they're using, we're getting a chance to see what's being taught more. We're hearing the, the teachers in class, and I don't think that's a bad thing. You know, I think it, it helps parents uh, stay engaged. It shows children that their ca parents care about what they're learning, um, and I would like to see that trend continue, whether it will or not. Uh, parent engagement is important, and I think what we're seeing in the results of this is that only Democrats, moderates, liberals, you said, are, are only slightly more optimistic. It's pretty um, evenly split with folks who say, you know, we need to make some big changes. Let's give people a little bit more detail on this. We have another heat map, and that is on the education politicization uh, piece. In your opinion, in the past five years, has the classroom instruction in the local kindergarten through 12th grade schools become more or less political? We've already told you that the overall sense is that it's more political, and we can look at some interesting findings in the group. Many of them say much more political. Uh, when you look at less political, you, you barely get out of single digits anywhere, except, interestingly enough, among African-American voters, even then, 10 percent. Sure. I think it's less political. Right, now. which isn't much. Um, I thought it was also interesting that 18 to 34 age group uh, tended to think less so than the older, but... They, what would they know? They, what are they? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I, well, I, I mean, like you know, our eighteen thirty-four. Of to course, they don't know. That they don't know because this is how they grew up. They're yeah. seeing the 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 material and the instruction the same, very similar to what it is right now. Yes, no insult to our eighteen to thirty-four year old friends, but they have a <laughs> little bit less of a background. Well, you know, you have to have some historic knowledge of what it was, and I do know that when I was growing up, I didn't really know where my teachers stood politically until I got to to a public university, and it was very clear at that point. Um, so I think now it's it's clear to these kids uh, starting in you know elementary school, middle school, high school. Um, but you know an informed student, uh, and you know some of that is parents need to step in there too. 
In fact, one of the next questions in the poll, one that we're going to get to right about now, is dealing with a, a way to a, a attack this issue of concern about the politics in the schools. Lesson plan transparency. Voters feel that legislation to require teachers to post their lesson plans is needed so that parents know what's being taught in the classroom. That is an idea that's floating through the General Assembly piece of legislation. Support stands at a similar margin for requiring teachers to post their lesson plans. So if you look at the lesson plan legislation, uh, people think 48 percent, nearly 48 percent, think that legislation is needed so that parents will know what is being taught versus just 37 percent who think the legislation would create too much additional work for teachers. If you look at the second question along that line, posting lesson plans, uh, we have the, the, the strong support for that, 43 percent strong support and moderate support together versus only 34 percent who oppose. And once again, here's another topic that brings out the partisan sure. divisions. Republicans really support this idea. Democrats oppose it. Unaffiliated voters are split. Parents, 51 percent, so a little more than half, support the legislation. 54 percent feel it's necessary so that parents know what is being taught in the schools. You and I had a chance. We'll give people a little bit of background. <laughs> you and I had a chance to look at this information ahead of time. Sure. And we talked about this next finding, and that is the fact that suburban women were slightly more opposed than supportive of this. Mm -hmm. And you had some thoughts about that. I do. Uh, you know, I was a PTA president. I was a volunteer in my kids' school through their entire education process. And I think what we're seeing, in, particularly among suburban women, um, is that a lot of them are bearing the 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 challenges of helping out in the classroom, seeing, you know, what is needed. They, they see the symptoms of something that they aren't sure quite how to diagnose it um, and not sure how to treat it, but they're seeing the symptoms, they're seeing the challenges. And, it, and what they're seeing in many cases could be the bureaucracy of the system, it could be something at their local level, but either way, they are they feel bad for, for the teachers, the ones who are in there with that many kids and that they're really trying to get, um, get these kids through the process and reach with them and connect with them. And, and I think suburban women are seeing that those symptoms, perhaps not to the diagnosis or the treatment. So really, this shows you that messaging is going to be really important on this particular issue. And this may not be political. Lesson transparency is as much about what book is my kid going to read uh, as it is about uh, politics. I want to know what my student learns in English and history and math. And, and I want to be able to see what kind of instructions, the quality of the lesson plan for the coming year. And I think a lot of parents are becoming more engaged in that way. Especially after what we saw in the pandemic, sure. when, when parents really had to play a role in the education, it probably is more of a case of parents, moms, dads, whoever's playing the, the active role in their children's education are saying, we used to just send the kids off to school and say, they're going to get an education, right. we'll take care of other things. Now they know they have to play a role. And so seeing what the lesson plans are not only gives them a sense of, oh, is it getting political, but just what are they learning? How can I help? Right. You know, if, if I know what the lesson plan is, maybe I can bone up on some of this stuff and, uh, exactly and, right. and give them some help. So that's a very interesting finding. I'm sure this is something that the people who are pushing that legislation are going to want to pay a lot of attention to. Let's go to another education-related slide. Teacher classroom influence. This, this I found very interesting. What should be done about teachers having their personal beliefs in the classroom. Voters generally believe that teachers share their personal beliefs in the classroom in an attempt to influence the beliefs of their students. That was 57%. 62% of parents agree. So parents think this even more than the general sure. public. To address this, voters generally support requiring teachers to show no preference for certain ideas or prohibiting discussion of some topics. Looking at the, the left-hand side of the slide, the, the plurality, top uh, opinion there was 33 percent who believed that requiring teachers to show no preference, followed by 22 percent at prohibiting discussion of certain topics, then 15 percent cameras in the classroom, 11 percent saying publishing the teacher lesson plans online. So this was interesting to me in the sense that in our earlier slide we talked about the fact that the, the people in general and parents were more supportive of putting the lesson plans online. But when it came to affecting the way that teachers influence the classroom, that was only their fourth right. choice of how to do it. The, the first one was tell teachers don't 
put your personal sure. beliefs in the classroom. Second one was prohibit discussion of certain topics. Only when you got to number four did they say that uh, putting the teacher lesson plans online was the best way to go about it. What did you think when you looked at this? So there's a couple of things that I think we should consider. One is that the majority of people who participate in this poll are not parents. Um, and that, so that, that more or less gives you a thing. How would you implement something like this? And what we're also seeing is that teachers for the most part, in many lessons are given uh, you know, a standards of curriculum and, and those lesson plans are derived from that. The, the flexibility might be in things like history, which is where we're seeing a lot of conflict on what they're being taught. Um, I, I'm not sure how you would implement requiring them to not show a preference. Um, short of you know, presenting the lesson plans and you know, Parent participation, uh, particularly as it comes to bringing you know, guest speakers or, or helping your, your kids study and those kind of things, um, that's a very difficult question to answer. How would you implement this? Yeah, I thought it was interesting that one of the options put forward was placing cameras in the classroom. Right. 15% put that, and I believe this is your, your top idea. Sure. So the, the first idea is tell teachers don't share your personal right. beliefs. Second one was prohibiting discussion of certain topics. But placing cameras in the classroom got a higher percentage than publishing teacher lesson plans online. I wonder if some of the folks who uh, are among that 15% are the ones who really like having a ring doorbell <laughs> and some of those other things where you, you could be outside of your home but see what's going on. Sure. Or, or if you remember having the camera that's on your child when you're not in the room. Right. Uh, I, I think if you had cameras in the classroom and parents were able to see them at any time, Things would be a lot different. I think it would be interesting. I think you run into a lot of privacy issues with, with minors and, and having a, a camera available to them. And I know that there are a lot of uh, child care centers that do this and you sign a, a waiver to do it. I think it would be a challenging issue with privacy. Uh, but at the same time, I think that also shows speaks to the degree at which people are concerned about this. Yeah. We're going to switch gears now uh, from education to the economy and taxes. And before we get to the first question there, I should mention to folks, didn't at the outset, but I will now, if you have some questions for us, feel free, if you're following along, to submit them on Facebook. Our colleague, Brooke Medina, is monitoring very closely. She just gave us the thumbs up. And uh, she will pass along the questions to us, so we'll be happy to answer your questions to the extent that we can. We also should tell you that if you'd like to get all of the detail of this poll, you certainly can find it online at johnlock.org. Uh, you're getting just a, a top line view of what's happening, but we go in uh, with our posting online with all of the cross tabs so you can see what did Republicans think, what did Democrats think, liberals, conservatives, what did parents think, what did people of various uh, uh, ideologies or education levels, what did they think about these things? So you could find all of the material uh, posted at johnlock.org. Uh, the economy and taxes, that's always an important issue for folks. And our first question has to deal with people's personal financial situation. Most voters are saying that their financial situation is either about the same or worse than it was last year. That's bad news. Sure. A near majority feel that cutting state income taxes would be most beneficial in improving their current financial situation. So back-to-back -back questions there. The first one was personal financial situation, and we see that 46%, the plurality uh, opinion, said about the same, 34% roughly worse, only about 19% uh, saying things are better. I would guess a lot of that's the pandemic. Well, exactly. But but remember, uh, this time last year, we actually were in the middle of all these shutdowns, and a lot of people were out of work, and, and businesses were closing and all that. For, the, for that many people, 78%, I guess, total, saying same or worse, um, that's alarming because, in theory, we're supposed to be opening back up and moving fast, and we're hearing the economy is recovering. Uh, it hasn't quite hit the people yet who answered this poll. And very different among people of different types of backgrounds. You see that just 19%, we say, say that their financial situation has improved. And that's driven by people who already have high incomes right. and higher education. They're both at about 28%. So if you're already doing well this past year, you might have been doing better, which probably shouldn't surprise us because sure. so much now has been done online, things that require using computers, using technology, those things have spiked. If you are in a business where you're in a service economy and you actually have to deal with people, shake hands with them, serve them, right. 
it might be a much different uh, and much worse story. It, that's exactly right. It shows you that it, that it hit uh, those people, the people who have to be there in person, it hit them the most. And, and you know, those businesses are opening back up. We're still seeing a labor shortage in North Carolina. Uh, so as those people do get, you know, back to work, uh, hopefully those numbers will shift. Now, this next question, very interesting to me. What's the most beneficial way to go about addressing people's financial situation? This has to be something that uh, the legislative leaders will be happy to sure. see. And if you are one of the members of the General Assembly or someone in the Cooper administration who've been talking about this is the time for, to make transformational investments, sure. uh, you can't be as happy to see this result. Asking people what's the most beneficial way to address this issue, there were basically three options and then the unsure. Cutting state income taxes, far and away the highest result, 49% supporting that option. Increasing state government spending, only 14% picked mm -hmm. that option. Leaving things as is, a great libertarian sure. option here, 15%, although the libertarians would go for cutting the state income tax too. They're at 15%. And then unsure, 21%. I like on uh, on poll questions like this, the people who say unsure. I, I'm, I'm not <laughs> I'm not as happy when they say unsure about a particular candidate, especially sure. when it's November. But at this point, you might not really know what's, right. what's most beneficial, so to, to be unsure about it is fine. But for the debate that's going on right now sure. about whether to spend more money or to cut taxes and prioritize allowing people to use their own money as they see fit, this poll certainly suggests that allowing people to spend their money the way they want to and giving them more opportunities to do that is the way to go. I think so, and it's important to remember that you know this was a fairly evenly split party-wise poll. You know, this is Democrats, Republicans, uh, uh, unaffiliated. They're all weighing in on this poll. So to have uh, cutting taxes far and away the top selection really is telling when we look at this as a cross section of North Carolinians of a variety of, of Republican, Democrat, and unaffiliated. Yeah, very interesting to see how that will impact the debate as it takes place on Jones Street in the coming weeks. We know the state Senate, as soon as this afternoon, is going to be taking a vote on the budget that includes the tax breaks, includes a spending increase that's much smaller than what Governor Cooper has advocated. The governor hasn't said how he's going to respond to sure. a budget because he won't until the House has its plan and then the Senate and House negotiate. But when he looked at the Senate budget, he and his spokespeople have said they're, they're missing this opportunity for the transformational investment. If this poll is a good indication, only 14% sure, of the people think that's, think that's the best way to go right. about doing it. Uh, now let's look once again at the, another one of these great heat map slides. This one is on the personal financial benefit issue. Mm -hmm. For you personally, which of the following options would be most beneficial to your current financial situation? And when you look at that cutting state income taxes piece, pretty good results across sure. the board, even among people who you think, well, this is probably not their top priority. Among folks who describe themselves as liberals, 26% say that's the best option. 35% of them say increasing state government spending. So increasing state government spending gets the higher result, but it's not as far away as, say, uh, Republicans who say 75% of them say cutting the state income tax sure. versus 1% right. who want to increase state government spending. Sure. Well, and you also have to look across the regions. I think that one of the things that we're seeing is that uh, there's far fewer people in, you know, the, the Raleigh area, for example, just like we saw in the other one, um, that would want to see cutting state income taxes. It really, as you move west and more to the central and coastal area, more people think that cutting state taxes um, would be the best way to see it. Yeah, very interesting stuff. Of course, that will be the, the source of debate for weeks and months to come and years to come because sure. that's never uh, an issue that's, that's, that's settled. Let's talk once again about another item that is on the plate for the General Assembly, and that is state tax reform. The question as asked, the North Carolina General Assembly is considering a proposal that would reform North Carolina's tax system. Among other things, it would lower the flat tax rate for personal income from 5.25% to 4.99%, and I'll stop right here and add the caveat, this was done as that was the, the item that was sure. on the plate. I mean, this poll was conducted recently, but not since senators came out and said, hey, we want to go beyond that. Sure. 
we actually would cut to 3.99% a few years out from this budget. So at the time that this question was asked, and it's still true that the initial proposal would be to cut the flat tax rate for personal income from 5.25% to 4.99%, would also phase out the corporate income tax by 2028. The proposal would increase the per child state tax deduction and increase the standard deduction on personal income. Do you support or oppose this tax reform proposal? Pretty good support there. There really was. We're looking about 74 percent. Um, we're looking about 52 percent su supporting it. And I think that one of the things um, that we're seeing is that about half of the people, um, we have this little slice that says they're unsure, but you know, only 22 percent would oppose this plan. I was actually on a uh, radio uh, program this morning, uh, WAAV in Wilmington, and one of the callers said, hey, why? would we go to a zero corporate tax? And I think it's interesting because that's what this new plan would be, would be to phase out to zero the corporate tax. And one of the points that I think does get lost is that uh, corporate tax is not just folks, Apple and, and a lot of our large companies. It's also the guy running the smoothie store down the street and, uh, you know, uh, small businesses across the across the state. Um, and that zero corporate income tax sort of would level, the theory is it levels the playing field so that these incentive packages don't just go to some uh, businesses. They would be across the board. Yeah, I'm going to give you the wonk answer, too. This is, uh, <laughs> I, I think the research folks would probably punch me if I didn't mention this, but uh, the John Locke Foundation has been against the corporate income tax in general forever, basically, because the corporate income tax is a hidden tax. Corporations, as such, don't really pay taxes. People pay taxes. And so when you have a corporate income tax, it's going to fall on the workers, the consumers, or the shareholders. Most everyone who's for a corporate income tax says, yeah, the shareholders sock those rich guys and gals because they can afford to pay it. Well, that's not quite the way it goes. Yes, some of the shareholders are people who have high incomes, high wealth, can afford to, to pay a higher tax. Guess what? These are also the people who can move their money the most the, the, in the easiest manner. So when you raise that corporate income tax, they can shift to something else that has less of a tax. Workers have less of a time moving. So if they get less pay or less likelihood of a higher pay, less of an increase in benefit because of a corporate income tax, they have to live with it. If consumers are going to end up paying higher prices, sure. they've got to live with it. And remember that a lot of the shareholders are 401k plans. So it's sure. middle class taxpayers trying to, to build up their income and the corporate income tax hits them as well. So it, it's a hidden tax. It also in years past has been used as what we have described as a negative slush fund, mm -hmm. where in years past when we had a really high relative corporate tax rate, governors would say, yeah, you know, our corporate tax rate's high, but you big company that I like so much, we're gonna give you a break. So it, it worked in the same way as one of these targeted tax incentives. So yes, uh, there's a lot of work that needs to be done sure. telling people why the corporate tax is a bad thing and why it's a good idea to phase it out. Sure, and I think that that's what we're seeing is that that message is getting through to voters that they want to see the reduction in taxes, um, and particularly the corporate income tax doesn't seem to be um, as much of an issue as they would like to see the um, the personal income tax. And raising that standard deduction is really important because then it would pull off, they would increase the number of people in that zero tax bracket for income. And that's an important thing, particularly coming out of the, a pandemic that really struck a lot of the lowest income people. For those who have not followed, the Senate's plan would increase the current standard deduction, which is uh, $10,750 for an individual filer, $21,500 for a married couple mm -hmm. filing jointly. It would bump that up by $2,000 per person. Right. So $12,750 for a, an individual filer, $25,500 for a married couple filing jointly. For those of you who don't uh, aren't really following the math, here's the key number to know. If you're at a married couple, you're filing North Carolina income tax. If this proposal went forward, the first $25,500 of your income, lop it off. Right. Tax man can't touch it. Yes. You're only gonna be taxed on the rest. And uh, we also mentioned the child tax deduction. For those who are making under, it would change uh, in this plan, under $70,000 for an individual 
or $140,000 for a married couple, you would see a $500 increase in the per child deduction, which makes a big difference. Uh, Senate leaders have said that they expect that these changes would take 200,000 people off the tax rolls right. who are paying income right. tax now. Amazing. Let's, let's look at the uh, heat map again. State taxes and competitiveness. Do you believe that states with higher taxes or lower taxes are more economically competitive? That was the question. Voters agree that states with lower taxes are more economically competitive. 51% you think, oh, it's close. No, only 15% <laughs> said, no, it's the, the states with higher taxes. And this sentiment holds with varying intensity across parties. Among Republicans, uh, no surprise that it's, that it's a, a, as high as it is. With Democrats, a little bit closer, though they still agree that the, the lower tax states have the, have the edge. And among the unaffiliated, it's a, almost a 20-point margin, 21% thinking the higher tax states do better, 40% thinking the lower tax states do better. This has to be good news for tax reform. Yeah, I think so. I think it does. And I think a lot of these numbers are not a huge surprise. But, you know, North Carolina is has been marching down that corporate tax rate for some time. Um, we're, we're, and that has increased increased its competitiveness across the country. Uh, when you look at groups like Site Selection Magazine and places like that, regardless of all the incentive packages you give, a low corporate tax rate is far and above, far and away the number one reason that a, com a company chooses its location, its home location, because in many cases, these incentives, they don't actually take advantage of them when it comes down to it, because maybe they don't create as many jobs as they said they would, or for whatever reason, a, a the low lower taxes is more economically competitive because it's fairer. Yeah, yeah and it certainly it doesn't pick any winners and losers, which is something that we've always had a problem at the John Locke Foundation with uh, with governors of, of all types and, and general assemblies of all types doing, deciding to give these targeted tax incentive packages to a particular company that they like, rather than just saying, let's level the playing field for everyone. Let's look a little bit more at, at some of the parts of this heat map, because I, th I find it very interesting. Mm -hmm. If you look at education levels, for those who have no college, once again, it's 11% who think that states with higher taxes are going to do better, but 53% states with lower taxes. If you have college, that uh, tightens up a little bit, but mm -hmm. still it's only 19% who think that states with higher taxes do better versus 40% who think that those with uh, lower taxes do better. Uh, if you look at the income level, same thing. It, it pretty much bears across the board that people realize states sure. with a lower tax burden are going to be more economically competitive. Sure, and I think we're seeing that, you know, people know they're in their own personal income taxes. They know how a company would think, and I think people um, are reading a lot more about this, particularly it's been in the news so much with North Carolina being uh, so able to recruit some really big companies because of the current business-friendly tax climate. Yeah, this is going to be something that will be a big issue going forward. Let's go now to our next slide, and this is about an issue, the I word, the return of the I word. <laughs> Commanding portion of voters say that prices of consumer goods and services have increased in the last year, but voters have not yet adjusted down their spending level on these items at this stage. So a couple of questions in a row. The first one was, Price changes, have they increased or decreased? 92% of people have seen prices increase. Uh, only 5% have seen the, the prices decrease. I want to meet these people know and know where they're shopping <laughs> and what things they're buying because uh, that might help me with my budget. Sure, sure. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe just, you know. They may be just doing a lot a lot more bargain shopping. Who knows? Yeah. But I think 92% a lot, a lot of people have seen it. And some of it may be that they are uh, changing what they buy. And that's why they're not seeing the price increase, because they may have different demands because of lifestyle change over the last year or something like that. Um, but, but I think the majority of people are really seeing that price of consumer goods. I think it's interesting. They haven't changed their habits yet. Uh, what that means to me is that a lot of folks are thinking, hey, well, this is a temporary thing. They're buying that that sort of uh, argument that this is a temporary price increase. Um, if it continues, I think it does become a political issue uh, as people realize that, you know, perhaps these are not temporary, you know, that uh, lumber prices, for example, has it driven up the increase of renovations in homes and construction projects. Um, if that were to continue, I think you'll see a change in people's buying habits and then a change in their voting habits. Yeah, I think you, you make a very strong point there, and that is when we look at people not changing their habits yet, 
they may be seeing the inflation, but not yet thinking that it's a major problem sure. that they're going to have to adjust to. If we start seeing a change in that spending impact that the people are spending less or they're mm -hmm. substituting, which because because that, that happens too, sure. they they wait a little bit longer to buy the new car or when they go get a car, they get one that has a few more miles on it than in the past. Uh, when they're going out to shop, they don't get the, the high grade of material that they were right. getting before. Because uh, that has ripple effects. Sure. Because the people selling you that high-end stuff, if you're not buying it, that impacts their bottom line. And so it has major impacts throughout the economy. That's going to be something for us to watch very much going forward. Mm -hmm. All right, next slide that we're going to go to now. This is an issue that actually, uh, right now. we just reported on this on Carolina Journal. I, I'm not sure. I don't think it's the top story at CarolinaJournal.com, no. but it's, it's one of the top stories right sure. now. That is the bill that was finalized yesterday that would have North Carolina end the $300 federal supplement to unemployment insurance. North Carolina voters are ready for this. They're ready to end the enhanced $300 per week federal unemployment benefit. 61% support that, 30% oppose it. And on a second related question, among those who feel that the extra payments provide too many workers with an incentive to remain unemployed, 57%. So as this bill, uh, we have good timing on this, sure. as this bill is heading to Governor Roy Cooper, who could decide what to do about it, if he looks at this latest Civitas poll, 61% of folks think, hey, it's time to end these benefits. Sure. And um, you know, among those who feel like one of the reasons why people have not returned to work is child care, this does, uh, that particular bill that it was headed towards his desk is going to have um, some child care benefits in it. Um, and a lot of folks are, are saying, well, you know, now school's out and people aren't back at work because child care options are limited. Um, but, you know, this, this would address both of those issues. And I do think it's interesting. Again, this is Democrats and Republicans answering this. So you have, with 61 percent, that means you're, you're really getting a, somewhat of a bipartisan view on whether, the, and North Carolina joins 25 other states that have already turned down this benefit partly because, you know, they don't want to see the federal money spent, but also because we're having a labor shortage in North Carolina. Yeah, and if you uh, saw the slide, one of the lines that said, however, Democrats and liberals are the only groups to net oppose ending the benefit. So it will be interesting to see if Governor Roy Cooper, when addressing the bill, uh, looks to his Democratic Party base, or does he look at the population as a whole? I would not be surprised if he looked at what Republicans think and said, Thank you, and he'll move on. But unaffiliated voters and others who are important to Democrats' future electoral success, he might want to keep that in mind. Uh, before we go to the next slide, let's go ahead and get to a question, and you can feel free to submit your questions via Facebook. Travis Lewis in Lexington asks us, do you think financial pressure from inflation partly explains how warm voters seem to be to income tax cuts? Well, I think that's interesting. I think that really is, uh, it, it, it very well could be. I think that people are um, seeing that prices are going up. They're uh, perhaps alarmed, even if they haven't changed their habits yet, that prices will continue to go up. And anything that brings a little bit more cash into the house really is going to get a warm reception. Yeah, Travis, thank you for that question. And you may be onto something there because earlier on we were talking about our interest in the fact that Support for tax cuts, I'm not surprised that support for tax cuts is up there. If you put tax cuts in isolation, most people are going to say, oh, yeah, I'd like to pay lower sure. taxes. Remember, that question basically set cutting taxes against increasing government spending right. as an either-or choice. And there was much more support for the uh, cutting the taxes Maybe some people who might, in other circumstances, have said increasing government spending sure. are looking at the inflation and saying, no, I just need, I need right. more money. Right, right. So, so Travis may be on to yeah, something. Interesting. There. All right, let's go ahead now and move on to the, the, the next item. Once again, this is one of our uh, heat map slides. I really like these. The question is, as you may know, because of COVID-19, the federal government gave states extra money in order to increase payments to people who are unemployed, which of the following statements most closely matches your opinion on this topic? So the options were, with so many schools and child care options closed or on reduced schedules, which you referenced a little bit earlier, many workers are unable to return to work. The other side of the coin was these extra payments provide too many workers with an incentive to remain unemployed since they can make enough to survive without working. 
looking at the heat map, almost all the groups are in the second category saying, you know, it's, it's time to end this. What's interesting to me is that these benefits were going to go away in September anyway. Sure. Uh, but the situation at, at this point is such that legislative leaders and a majority in both the House and Senate said, look, we need to stop it now. We right. can't wait to September. We need to get people back to work. Ending this extra federal unemployment is a good way to do it. I think so, and I think a lot of times in the summer, folks are going to uh, going to the beach and more tourism areas. They're seeing that restaurants and stores can't be staffed. They can't keep their get back to normal, back to nor normal open, opening hours. Um, and a lot of that is because of a labor shortage. So it really is a kitchen table topic, much more so than other unemployment benefits might have been in other cases. Yeah, very interesting. I think we're going to be having to watch very closely. And I like the point that you made about people not changing their spending habits mm -hmm. yet, because I think we're going to really have to watch that. If they do start changing the spending habits and seeing inflation sure. stop them from the things that they want to do, mm -hmm. then I think we're, that could have a very big uh, political impact. We have another good uh, question for us, and please feel free to, to submit them at Facebook, the John Locke Foundation's Facebook page. Of course, you're there because you're watching it already. But uh, we love to get your questions, and we're going to be talking about them. Uh, probably going up to almost 1 o'clock today. Uh, if we don't get any more questions from the audience, and we definitely want your questions, but uh, we'll, we'll chat about some other things that we didn't cover on the slides. But here's another good one coming from Melissa Combs in Clayton. What are the thoughts behind the difference in approval ratings between Biden and Cooper? And uh, while you're thinking about that, I'm going to go back on the slides and, sure. and find that once again, because that, that is interesting. We have seen that uh, the president, as we said, is about one to one. Uh, he is right now slightly underwater in North Carolina, which to me is not a great surprise. Sure. Donald Trump won the race here in North Carolina, so you might expect that people would be a little uh, more inclined to be critical of Joe Biden, but he's not doing terribly. Mm -hmm. His approval rating, just a couple of points below his disapproval. Whereas for Roy Cooper, right. much better news for him. Not quite as good in June as it was in May, but still seven points ahead, 49% approval versus 42% who disapprove. Um, I think for me, one of the reasons for that is mm -hmm. the fact that uh, we have seen over the years, this has been true for decades, that North Carolinians treat the way they vote for federal offices yes. differently than they treat the way they vote for state offices. And I think Roy Cooper, uh, at least in presentation and style mm -hmm. and the way that he goes about things, certainly resembles the Democrats that we have seen in charge of North Carolina government sure. over the years for, for decades. He does not come across as an Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez or a sure. Bernie Sanders. And so I think people are much more comfortable with him than they would be with some of these national Democratic figures that they don't like as much. Sure. I think one of the things that we're really seeing, if you look at this particular slide, um, in May, uh, Governor Cooper had a much higher approval rating uh, than than President Biden. But remember, May is kids were back in school. And after having not been in school for a year, you know, suddenly they get a chance to have something of a normal life and parents are able to breathe again. It feels like I think that accounts for the bump. But then it, of course, went back down. And, you know, to your point, the style is, is very different. Um, he is uh, he his his press availabilities are quite limited. His um, his you know personally tweeting out and in in uh, in, a, in a sort of an uncontrolled off message way is quite limited. Uh, we don't see that as much as we saw with say for President Trump. Um, I think that you know sometimes the less you say works works in your favor in this case. Um, and that may bump I think is from schools. I think another thing we need to keep in mind, and this is something I am sure that political strategists of all stripes in North Carolina have been looking at and will continue to look at, and that is the phenomenon of the Cooper-Trump voters. Mm -hmm. uh, some people might say, well, who are these voters who support both Governor Roy Cooper and now former President Donald Trump? They voted for both of them in 2016, voted for both of them again in 2020. It is a not insignificant group sure. of people who are willing to break along party lines to support two people who, in presentation and style, so different. very different, very different people. But for some reason, uh, voters latch on to both of them. 
and I think that there is a, a work has to be going on oh, right now sure. in probably every political shop saying, how do we get those Cooper Trump voters for our guy or gal? Right, right. Well, I think some of what we're seeing, though, is that um, North Carolina has done that for a long time. They've voted Democrat at the state and local level and perhaps uh, conservative or Republican at the federal level. That's something that is not unusual. Um, I do think, though, that President Trump brought out a group of voters that perhaps had not even followed politics for a long time, felt very disenfranchised from the process, did not cast their vote as often um, in the past, in recent decades, uh, that they then came out and voted for President Trump. Um, I think that accounts for a large percentage of that group. And they may have only voted for one person. Um, you know, we don't, you know, really know in that. So I think that we're seeing new voters entering the sphere under Trump, but we're also seeing a, a continuation of North Carolina's um, more, more liberal post in local and state elections. We have another question, and I'm going to tell you before I even ask the question, my answer is I don't know, but I'm going to give you a, a, a little bit of information about how, how you could answer that question. The question comes from Mindy Banks in Raleigh and is, how does the Locke Foundation choose what issues are polled? My short answer is I don't know uh, because I'm not the one who, who, who chooses the poll questions, but I think if, if we have with us again the next time Donald Bryson, who is the president of the John Locke Foundation and has over, overseen the Civitas poll, he could probably give you a sense. My, my basic thought is some of the questions are going to be typical horse race questions. Sure. You know, approval, disapproval, the governor, the president, what's the generic ballot for the Congress and the legislature? Those are the types of things that we can expect month in, month out. Sure. I'm guessing we're probably going to be seeing that inflation question, if not each time certainly on a fairly regular basis. But in terms of the issues that seem to crop up at one poll or another uh, and, and may not come back again, that's the type of thing where I know that Donald spends a lot of his time looking at what are some of the important issues to people. Sure. What, are, what are things that are being talked about? What are the, the hot issues at the General Assembly? How would our polling help guide what's taking place there? So Donald would give you a much more thorough answer about how he goes about it, but I know it comes about because he's keeping track of what's going on in North Carolina. In fact, you know, we had questions this time around about education and whether it's mm -hmm. uh, going in the right direction or on the wrong track. A lot of that is because that's what we're hearing. That's we're exactly hearing people right. complain about use of critical race theory in the mm -hmm. schools or indoctrination. That's the type of thing we want to know. What, do people really think this? Is, it, is this just the people who talk to us? Or is this generally true throughout North Carolina that people have concerns about what's going on in the schools? That is true, and I think we see a lot of that, um, you know, through Carolina Journal, what interaction we have from readers. Uh, those those got a lot of it, and, and it does give us a chance to see what the general cross-section of North Carolinians think, not just those who are interacting with us and, or, and through our website. And Brooke Medina reminds us that this is also based on what's happening in national and state politics. So if there are some issues that, that will crop up that haven't been in a Civitas poll before, it may be because it's something that's in the headlines. And, and we will see questions like that. I suspect also that if there's something that you would like to see the Locke Foundation poll, if you send an email to Donald Bryson, he'll certainly consider it. Uh, Donald's email is dbryson, B-R-Y-S-O-N, at lockhq.org. And I'm sure he would welcome your suggestions. Doesn't mean, doesn't mean he's going to put the, a poll question in there, but he would want to know, I'm certain, what, what, know? what, yeah. pe what people are interested in seeing polled. So we do have some time if there are any additional questions out there. While we're waiting for those to, to come about, Donna, I, I want to talk to you once again uh, about probably a key issue, and we just referenced it a couple of minutes ago, but this is something we talked about earlier in the presentation for those who are just joining us. Voters who feel that education is on the wrong track and that yes. politic politicization, politicization, one of my favorite words to say three times fast, that politicization is playing a major role. I was very interested in those findings. I thought it might be more of a partisan divide, mm -hmm. that, that Republicans would say, yes, this is a, a problem, Democrats would say, no, not a problem at all. Right. Unaffiliateds would be somewhere in the middle. It really is leaning more toward people, regardless of party, regardless of ideology, see some concerns about 
this uh, politics in the classroom. That was a surprise, and actually, I, I know that there are a lot of other news outlets have been saying, oh, "Well, this is a dog whistle for conservatives," or you know, it's only only conservatives are worried about that. This shows that it's not that this is something that people are experiencing across the board. Uh, that uh, regardless of your political ideology, that you do see that there's a problem. Uh, you know, whether you know what the problem is or not, you know that that could change. Um, but I do think that this is something that will really resonate with those who need to start working on what this reform is going to look like, whether it's, you know, expansion of school choice, whether it is more transparency or some combination of all those. Yeah, and in fact, uh, of the items that were on the list in the question, and we'll see if I can find that there while we're talking about it, one of the, the key things was this idea of having lesson, tra lesson plan transparency but then we asked people, what do you think is the best way to reduce the, the likelihood of uh, classroom teachers getting their opinions out there to try to influence the students? The plurality, 33%, basically said require teachers to show no preferences for certain ideas, sure. just present them. Right. And not say, oh, this is a terrible idea from this group or a terrible idea from that group. And then the second one was prohibit discussion of certain topics, which I think could be a, a interesting and potentially dicey sure. item. I mean, there are some things that a lot of people wouldn't want to see or hear discussed, right. but probably need to be. So sure. you would have to have a, a lot of debate about that. In terms of publishing teacher lesson plans online, a lot of people thought that was a good idea, mm -hmm. but we saw that uh, as a, a way of addressing teachers injecting their personal beliefs into the classroom, it was only the fourth highest choice, sure. just less than 11%. I think this is going to be an issue that will really come to the fore uh, in, the, in the future. All right, so we've got another question here. Uh, this one comes from Wes Matheny. The North Carolina Board of Education approved a new K-12 history standard on June 16th. Is this the type of social studies teaching the direction North Carolina wants to go in? Did the voters approve the ones making that decision? Well. Uh, a brief civics lesson, the Board of Education, no one votes on the Board of Ed, the North Carolina Board of Education. You certainly vote on your local school board. The State Board of Education is uh, appointed by the governor for the most part. There are some seats sure. that are on there. The treasurer and lieutenant, lieutenant governor, governor yeah. sit on that board by virtue of their position. The others are appointed by the governor, but they're staggered terms. Right. So at this point, now that he's been in office in his fifth year, Governor Roy Cooper certainly, I believe, has a majority on that state board, but it took him a while. Sure. When he started, there were still a lot of appointees from Pat McCrory and probably still some appointees from Beverly Cooper sure. because they're long terms. Good, so that yeah. state board of education is appointed by the governor, but on staggered terms. Uh, so did North Carolina voters vote for the people who made that decision? Uh, really sort of in a roundabout, yes. roundabout way. And over time. And we're seeing the lieutenant governor, of course, really capitalize on that role and uh, throw himself into it. North Carolina's lieutenant governor position is something that is defined by the person who, who sits in the chair in large part, and he's taken on the facts task force and a lot of the things that have to do with public education and his role on that state board. Um, he's really taken that to heart and, and run with the ball in that way. Um, the the so social studies standards are interesting. I've spoken with a couple of social studies teachers, and some have said, look, when you teach math, you know this is what you teach first, then this, then this, then this. Social studies at the moment is kind of wide open and, uh, and open to interpretation. Uh, so a lot of teachers... Some of them say, okay, well, I got to go dig up my lessons plan lesson plans. I have to decide them myself. But that's also where you get in some of the conflict um, that we're seeing through things like these social studies standards and people alarmed by what may be teaching. And Wes, thanks for the question, because that uh, also reminds us that the standards themselves were approved, I believe, back in February. It was a close vote. I think it was 7-5 mm -hmm. yes. on that board, very close. What just got approved were some documents that go along with the standards. And if you didn't follow this at Carolina Journal, you might want to go to carolinajournal.com and look up the story because it was very interesting. There was a, a, a glossary that yeah. came out, and the glossary had some terms that were going to be used as part of the social studies standards. And our colleague Terry Stoops, who's the director mm -hmm. of the Center for Effective Education at the John Locke Foundation, decided to look at where the information for this glossary came from. Because it was, mm -hmm. there, there was no citation at the time. And he found that sometimes the information came from a standard online dictionary, probably okay. Sometimes it came from a Wikipedia page. 
maybe not as okay. Sometimes from a left of center uh, website, probably a little less okay. There was one, the definition for human rights, that came from the fashion website H&M. <laughs> because they've had some human <laughs> rights issues at H&M, so they had something on their website about uh, human rights, and right. that apparently was what was used Made for the glossary. Made it into the glossary. So Terry Stoops uh, wrote a blog post, raised some concerns about this. Uh, the State Board of Education ended up, some key leaders there saw that blog post. They decided, uh, we're gonna take a little bit more time. Sure. When they came back, uh, more than a week later, they had a, a new and updated glossary that had citations of where sure. the information came from, looked like it was a little bit better material, and then they approved that information. Well, I'm gonna look one more time here, and it looks like we have no more questions in to Brooke. She is uh, confirming that that is true. We have reached the one o'clock hour, so it's probably time for us to, to wrap things up. Before we do, mm -hmm. any final thoughts about something from this poll that you either found especially interesting or that surprised you? I think that one of the things that I really found interesting was that the messaging on the um, on the tax cuts, and I think that that's something that we're going to see more of. I think more people are in favor of it than I initially uh, thought would be because you know th those things are very work are worked on a lot by the different uh, parties and the different um, legislative leaders who who want to really get their message out. But I also really thought it was interesting about education. I think we're going to be talking a lot more about that. Um, particularly with the with the transparency bill that I think we're going to be seeing, seeing in the General Assembly here soon. Yeah, it's going to be very interesting. I agree with you that one of the top things I saw was the debate about cutting taxes versus government spending because that has really been the clear choice in recent weeks that we've seen between Republican legislative leaders, especially the Senate, because they're the ones who, who put out their, their uh, budget plan at this mm -hmm. point. The House will shortly. But... Uh, between the, the legislative leaders and Governor Cooper, legislative leaders saying, look, yes, we know a bunch of money has flowed in, but we can't just spend all this money. That's not sustainable. This money, much of it should go back to people right. in tax cuts or be used for infrastructure, real real government investment, not, not, debt, not, not bonds, not, bonds yeah. not, not transfers where you're taking money from one person and giving it to another and hoping that that second person that the government chose is going to use it better. Whereas the, the governor and folks on his side of this argument have said, look, we've got a ton of money. Now is the time for transformational investments. Uh, the polling results from this latest Civitas poll suggest that the Republican legislative leaders have the better side of that argument, mm -hmm. at least among North Carolina voters at this time. Well, if you have some thoughts about this poll, you're certainly welcome to share them in the comments section on our Facebook page. Uh, if you have, as we said earlier, if you would like for the Civitas poll to cover something we have covered in the past, feel free to drop a line to Lock Foundation President Donald Bryson. He is the one who uh, it is, takes the lead role on that poll at this point. I'm sure he would love to hear some input about it. I've had fun sitting in for Donald on the, the Civitas poll virtual presentation. And for those of you who have been watching and say to yourself, you know, I would much rather be at a lunch talking <laughs> to my friends and seeing all this stuff in person. We're right there with you. That's going to be happening in the not too distant future. Stay tuned for more information about the next Civitas poll presentation, whether that's gonna be virtual or in person. I suspect, if I had to guess, that sometime before the year is out, we'll certainly be back in, uh, in full in-person presentation mode. Before signing off, I wanna thank my colleague, Donna King, who is the editor-in-chief at Carolina Journal. Excellent insights, and you'll read her work if you go to carolinajournal.com. Donna, thanks for joining me. Of course, thank you. Always fun, and of course, this uh, these poll numbers are live and available on uh, johnlock.org under polling, and we will, of course, be covering it as well on carolinajournal.com. Thanks so much for joining us, and have a great afternoon.